Well, I um, thank uh, uh, Professor Lee and the university for inviting me. And uh, I've been being here only, only once before. And I remember being uh, very well received and found uh, we had many comments and uh, some disagreements. And uh, we'll hopefully hear some of those today. So um, <clears throat> the, I suggest that there were two things to read that would be preparation for today. One was a, um, an article that I wrote, which is mainly uh, concerned uh, the explanation of Marx's ideas uh, on some things from Engels, uh, on the nature of dialectics. And the other is a text from Marx, which is uh, very often read and cited. It's called the, the Preface to the Contribution to the Critique of Political Economy where Marx gives a, a very compressed description of um, what we should call historical materialism or a major uh, topic of historical materialism. So those are the things that we'll be doing today. And we need to start with uh, material <coughs> on uh, dialectics to begin with. But just to be able to uh, fix our terminology a little bit, we need to be able to talk a little bit about the class structure of capitalism in the terminology that Marx would use. And uh, so that's what the first slide says, that the means of production are what workers need to produce things, so tools, factories, buildings, scientific knowledge. Later, we'll talk a little bit about the forces of production and the forces of production include these means of production and some other things in particular, the working class itself is a force of production. So the forces of production include the means. And then the capitalist class is the owners of the means of production. Now, <clears throat> usually in, in modern capitalism, this is usually done uh, through the legal form of a corporation. Generally, the corporations own the vast amount of means of production, and certainly in the United States, and maybe this is also true in Mexico. So uh, that the capitalist class we can define as the owners of means of production. In the United States, this group would constitute about one or one and a half percent of the population. Um, <clears throat> then we also need to use the term working class now, Marx also likes the term proletariat. Uh, and you'll run across that whenever you read anything by Marx or Marxists. But working class is just as good a term. So notice that there will be a lot of people who don't fit into this category. There will be people who uh, don't work for wages, but for example, engage in a small business. So your lawyer, if you need a lawyer, uh, probably is either uh, a self-employed person or, or uh, a member of a small practice doesn't easily fit into the category either of a worker or a capitalist. So we want to talk about uh, the concept of relations of production. So the relations of production roughly mean uh, who has power over the means of production and what happens to people who don't have power over the means of production, and that the social relations of production over the course of history have changed a lot, right? We have uh, an ancient history of, the, um, of humanity in which people lived by hunting and gathering, uh, and there was very little ownership of anything, uh, not much to own. We had a, a system of, uh, in which the main social relationship for production was slavery. This is true in ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, in Europe and in Asia, we had in the uh, beginning around 800 AD, we had the feudal system, right? A feudal system based on the monopoly of land ownership by a few, by a small class of people and the rest of the people were serfs, or sometimes in a third category. And then we have modern capitalism, which uh, people who are historians of capitalism date it in Europe from about 1000 AD. 
Uh, and uh, sometimes some people say it begins in southern France, in Provence. Other people look a little later at the, the towns around the Baltic, right? The uh, so-called Hanseatic League. Uh, capitalism uh, exists for a long time uh, as a system of employing with, uh, workers to work uh, and having capitalists make their income, their profit, on the basis of this. But capitalism doesn't become the dominant system uh, for a long time, right? And capitalism is, exists for over 500 years before it rules any place, right? So the English Revolution takes place in the middle of the 17th century, and the French Revolution takes place at the end of the 18th century, uh, and those are the places where uh, capitalism becomes the dominant system in Europe. And uh, of course, European imperialism spreads out over the entire globe and, spend, and, and uh, transmits the capitalist system uh, to places where they rule, even, of course, where places there people didn't want it. <laughs> so <clears throat> let's talk about what's the nature of the relations of production under capitalism. So first of all, Marx's contention is that all value is created by labor, right? It's only human labor that creates new value. Now, of course, there's a kind of value that comes from natural products, right? And air and water and fish in the sea are useful to us, but the kind of value that counts in, in economics, something that you could buy and sell, that kind of value uh, is created by human labor, Marx says. And he says, but workers can only live if they work for a capitalist, because workers don't own the means of production, they have to work for the people that do. Uh, and that this is not optional, right? If you're going to make a living, if you're going to eat, uh, you're going to have to work for a cap some capitalist or other. And Marx calls that arrangement wage slavery. So it's, it's not exactly like slavery where uh, a worker used to be the personal property of some person, uh, but Marx uh, saw it as the, uh, the working class as sort of the collective property of the capitalist class. They own us, although you can make a deal with different capitalists at different times in order to live. Uh, capitalists employ workers, but only on the condition that that employment produces a profit for the capitalists. And Marx's analysis of the source of profit is that workers create new value, and workers are paid a wage, which is a portion of that new value. But workers are only allowed to work if the amount of value they create is more than the value they receive in wages. So that unpaid labor, Marx calls this surplus labor, labor not paid for, is the source of all profit and other kinds of income like interest and rent in the capitalist system. So that means that capitalism is at bottom and in essence an exploitative system. Right? That is, it's a system which is taking which compels workers to give up a great deal of what they produce without compensation. So because of, of the exploitative nature of capitalism, workers and capitalism are in a situation of conflict. Roughly speaking, not in every case, but roughly speaking, if workers have to be better, are going to be better off, the capitalists are going to be worse off because of it, and vice versa. However, their relationship is complicated enough that it has a name. We don't just call it a conflict. Marx will call this a dialectical contradiction. So what does it mean to be a dialectical contradiction? It means that there is a combination of conflict and also of dependence. So um, capitalists need workers in order to make a profit. But workers need capitalists in order to have a job, right? In order to support themselves with wages. 
So each side has a kind of dependence on the other side, and yet they're in conflict. So that combination of dependence, mutual dependence, and conflict, or each side sort of interferes with the other, tries to mess up the aims and plans of the other, that kind uh, is called a dialectical contradiction. And we'll look at some other dialectical contradictions. But first, it's useful <coughs> if we have a more abstract category than contradiction, we'll call this an organic relationship. Uh, Marx lays out his ideas of this in a book he wrote in the late 1850s. It never came out as a book, but it's a big manuscript called the Grundrisse. And an organic relation is a relation in which the things that are related are at least partly determined, partly a part of what they are is constituted by the relationship they have to each other. So there are easy homely examples of this. The example of the parent-child relationship, right? As I have had a, five children, and they are profoundly influenced by me and my wife, both biologically and socially. And of course, the relationship also works the other way, right? That it has had a huge effect on me and my wife that we've had these particular children that we have. And uh, the relationship, <coughs> alters over the over the years, right? And when the kids are little, their parents make decisions for them. And when you get to be my age, my parent, my children now thinking they should be able to tell me what to do and maybe they're right. So uh, another example we just talked about is the worker capitalist relation is an organic relation. It's organic because the capitalists ha have to be influenced by the workers that they interact with, and workers are influenced by the capitalists that they interact with. Now, their roles are usually different, but sometimes you'll even find capitalists who are sort of worker-like. Uh, they say Bill Gates used to be like that. He wrote, he, he, he hired people to write computer code, but then he read the code. Right? Now that's kind of unusual, I think, in an industry, but it does happen sometimes, right? So that there's a, an interaction and a, even a kind of sharing of some, kind of, of some properties. Uh, for a physics example, you can consider the, this is for physics students only, in electromagnetism we have uh, equations called Maxwell equations which tells how the electric field influences the magnetic field and how the magnetic field influences the electric field. So that combination of interrelationships is an organic relation. So the things which are related organically are called moments of that relationship. So my children are moments, <laughs> each one of them is a moment, uh, of the relationship between me and them, and I'm a moment of the relationship between them and me. Uh, so Marx described the capitalist economy as a combination of three moments, production, consumption, uh, and distribution. Did I set that off? Yeah, it's there, it's exchange or distribution. Uh, and he says some of those moments have a, have a stronger effect on the others than vice versa. So a moment which is dominant is the mo a moment that has the biggest effect on the others. And there also can be one or more subordinate uh, uh, <coughs> moments. Uh, typically, in an organic relationship, one side is likely to be have the upper hand, be the dominant one. But it's not permanent. Uh, here's a, the red thing up there tells you something which is very important for us in the application a little further down the line. Marx tells us that in an organic relationship, causation is never one directional only. Right? So if, if moment A influences moment B, then moment B will also influence moment A, even if that influence is, is, is not equal. So <coughs> Marx's idea is that production is the dominant moment in the capitalist economy, 
But the other moments are important. They're just not the top dogs. So <clears throat> now we can define a, a dialectical contradiction sort of over again with a little more information. We can say a dialectic contradiction is an organic relation of two moments such that the two moments are opposites, right? So what's on one side isn't somehow incompatible with what's on the other side. Uh, but the moments, or sides, depend on each other. So there's a kind of unity between the opposite sides. On the other hand, in a contradiction, the moments also interfere with each other. They struggle, right? So what one side is trying to do will interfere with what the other side is trying to do. Uh, and this conflict between them is called negativity. So um, this is a term that comes, that Marx borrows from Hegel. And uh, in dialectical thought, the idea of negativity, that is interference or conflict or struggle, is a very fundamental one. And we just have a big, a high sounding word for it. Uh, so we can use an example, a homely example would be a soccer match, right? So we imagine two teams, each of which is in a kind of organic relationship with the other, right? Uh, when one soccer team tries to figure out how it could win the match, it has to adjust its strategies and distribute its personnel depending on the strengths and weaknesses of the other side. Right? So each side has to try to match up as well as possible so that it can hold back the other side, both play defense and have your own offense and be successful, right? find a hole to get through. So a soccer match is a dialectical contradiction. Uh, it's a special kind of dialectical contradiction, though, because it has a whistle that blows at the end, and then the contradiction is all over, and the players can go out for a beer and be friends again, right? So, but during the, during the contest, we have a struggle, right? A negativity. So why do contradictions matter? And the main thing that the contradiction does that's important is that it causes change. That is, when it, it's, I mean, a, one fanciful way of putting it is something like this. It's like the universe doesn't really like contradiction, and it, it has a tendency to change in such a way as to try to minimize the contradiction. Now, that's, that's not Marx. That's just a metaphor, OK? So, uh, the contradiction between uh, two sides in a soccer match makes lots of changes, right? So we already talked about those a little bit. The contradiction between imperial powers. So my list of imperial powers uh, on the planet right now would be uh, the United States, uh, China, uh, the, the European Union, and then some many smaller players, right? Even uh, much smaller countries like Sweden has a kind of imperial effect. Uh, and the contradictions between imperial powers frequently lead to wars, and sometimes those are to lead to mass death, right? That's a huge, big change. Uh, contradictions between capitalists and workers lead to changes, right? That is, there's uh, workers do reform activities like um, uh, <coughs> union organizing and strikes. They have, uh, sometimes when they're not very well organized, they have rebellions. Uh, and uh, Marx's view is that this, this, these changes would eventually lead to revolutions, some of which would be successful enough that they would end capitalism or end it on some parts of the globe. So contradictions don't last forever. Uh, the question is then what happens when the contradiction ends? And there's a number of different terminology, pieces of terminology that people use for this. Uh, the ending of a contradiction. In German, it is called Aufhebung. And sometimes people just use the German term. I'm usually going to use the term resolved. The contradiction is resolved if it's, if it's over. Uh, but superseded 
In the reading by Althusser, you'll see he uses superseded or supersession, it means resolution. Uh, and sometimes people say the contradiction is overcome. Uh, and part of the, <clears throat> well, contradictions which are over no longer cause change. But often they give rise to some new contradiction which itself could cause change. So suppose we have a battle between two armies, uh, and it may be that one side defeats the other. And of course, they both aim at that. Uh, but the side which wins then will either destroy or, or completely overpower the other side. But uh, a war consists of many battles usually, and it may be that even though the, the, the contradiction of a particular battle is resolved, a new contradiction takes place next week or next month uh, and could be bigger or smaller than the one that took place already. So <clears throat> the idea, and this is an idea that really comes from Hegel. So let me talk a little bit about the history of dialectics. You can, in Western philosophy, you can see dialectics uh, going uh, at least back to the philosophers before Plato. And the one that was important particularly is uh, Heraclitus. And Heraclitus said that conflict or war is the father of everything. So of course now we would say the father and mother of everything, but still a, a profound idea that is present in the whole tradition of dialectical thought that goes back before Heraclitus. And there are also traditions in, in outside the West, and there's a dialectical tradition in China, for example. So, but uh, the sort of the fullest development of dialectics before Marx, dialectical thought is in Hegel. So he's a, a German philosopher who died in 1831. So Marx was just a kid when that happened. But he, Hegel gave rise to a whole uh, generation, even longer than a generation, of people who were profoundly influenced by his dialectical thinking. And Marx was one of those people. So this idea that resolving or supersession always preserves something from each side. It means that this is a, a let's say, an idea that's in Marxism that comes from it. Uh, and sometimes this idea, of the result of the, of the um, <coughs> contradiction that's resolved is called synthesis. Personally, I think that's a very poor term. It's misleading, but that's another day to talk about that. Uh, so let me give you an example from Mao Zedong, uh, who talked about what synthesis means. Mao Zedong's idea was that what happens in a resolution of a contradiction is that one side eats the other up, but spits out some of the pieces. Right? He's famous for trying to have formulation of philosophical ideas that everybody could understand. So he gives an example of the relationship between the communist movement and the, the nationalists in China, the Kuomintang, a uh, long civil war, which the communist movement actually eventually won. And his analysis says, the nationalists and the common part, communist party being two opposites, they have been synthesized, meaning the communists won. We swallowed them up piece by piece. All the enemy's rifles, artillery, and troops were synthesized, Isaiah absorbed into our side. And then he explains that, he says, we recruited them if they wanted to go home, we let them go home. But generally speaking, we took over the resources of the defeated side. So something's always preserved. So let's talk about examples of resolving contradictions. Uh, the contradiction in the soccer match ends when the whistle is over. Although sometimes people argue for days about whether the calls were right, right? So uh, most contradictions move toward uh, resolution by what Marx and Hegel calls development 
And development involves several things, but the most important part is, the, is intensification. It means that the conflict or the negativity between the two sides becomes worse or better, depending on your point of view. It becomes more intense, right? Uh, and the two sides interfere with each other more. So when a contradiction is resolved, one side defeats the other, but the other side wouldn't necessarily completely disappear, but is overpowered. Uh, truces and compromise do not resolve contradictions. They just postpone the resolution, right? If you have a truce, then you need to fight another battle in the future. Compromises work the same way. So let's begin to talk about now historical materialism. We'll use some of the, of the information that we got from dialectics because that's going to be built into this idea. So okay, Marx says that social relationships of production, I think maybe not all social relationships, but the ones that concern production, that is, who has the power over the means of production and who gets the wealth from the economic activity, the social relationships that concern that, he says, are material. And of course, that doesn't mean they're made out of matter. It means that they have a certain status, which we can say has a, some things. So he says, first of all, material relations have their own laws of motion. They have features and tendencies of change that are um, objective meaning they really happen, and you can investigate them, uh, scientific methods, right? They're objective, but you can't make them disappear just by wishing so, right? That is, the, re the relations of production are what they are, whether you love them or hate them, or have some attitude, attitude in between, right? Human will doesn't change them. Now, if humans make a project to change the, the relations of production, they may succeed. But you can't just wish them out of existence. Right? So I think that that's what Marx means by the saying social relations are material, objective, real, their own laws of motions. So here are, this is my slide. I'm just telling you why I think Marx would agree with this slide. but. Uh, what, what I thought were the law, uh, laws of motion of contemporary capitalism, right? So the rich get richer and social inequality grows. Marx certainly did say that, right? The profits are only possible if wages are kept down, right? There's an upper limit on what wages can be and still have the system persist. Uh, companies that don't maximize profits risk being eaten up by competitors, right? This is competition. Competition is dog eat dog. Right? You, your company can be driven out of existence, uh, even if last year it was success. Uh, the rate of profit gradually falls. Now this is uh, a claim that uh, Marx defended, and he thought this was a uh, a scientific outcome of his work that the, the rate of profit has a tendency to fall. And that uh, when I was here before, I showed you some graphs by uh, various um, leftist economists which demonstrated that that's true in the world and uh, true in most countries of the world. A few exceptions, like over the last few years, the rate of profit in Germany has actually risen, but I wouldn't expect that to happen to Kenya Goey. And the, the, the tendency of the rate of profit falls creates giant crises. It's one of several different mechanisms within the laws of motion of capitalism that tends to produce crises. Some of the other mechanisms have to do with financial stuff. So now we're going to talk about uh, the material that comes from the, the uh, preface to the critique of uh, political economy. Right. This is a famous uh, work that Marx wrote in 1859. The rest of the book, Marx didn't, eventually didn't think much of. He didn't try to, to do it over again and uh, reissue the book. But the preface is a classic. And the preface describes a, a way of analyzing the changes in, uh, in, not just in capitalist society, but in a variety of societies.
that uh, we'll call the basin superstructure model, and that there are other places in Marx and Marx and Engels' writing where they lay this out, but the one we have is short and sweet. Right. So first of all, we want to say the economic base, or we we'll just call it the base, is the totality of relations of production. Uh, sometimes people make mistakes here, and they think that the economic base is the forces of production. And we'll talk later about what's the relationship between the relationships of production and forces of production. But the economic base is the relations of production. The superstructure uh, consists of basically two sides here. One of them is government, politics, and law. And the other is ideas, forms of social consciousness. Uh, law would also fit into that category. Religion, philosophy, morality. Uh, these are ideas that uh, may be widely accepted, and they're ideas which Marx says uh, tend to be created uh, because they serve the interest of whatever the dominant class is, but there also can be other kinds of ideas that don't serve those interests. So the idea is that the superstructure and the base are organically related, right? Each of them has some influence on the other. Uh, but there's a, there's a dominant moment in this relationship, and the dominant moment is the base. And we'll look at a picture of that in a minute. So the mode of production is a term which we may not actually need this, but it's used by Althusser, so that's why I will need it tomorrow. It's the base plus the forces of production. It's what people produce and how they produce them, which is different in different historical eras. So, so here's a picture. <laughs> and the idea is this is supposed to show you three different sets of uh, social relationships of production. We could call this three different modes of production. And the stuff at the bottom, it's at the bottom because it's the base, mm -hmm. there's three different modes of production. And the stuff at the bottom, it's at the bottom because it's the base, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, it rests on it, depends on it, is superstructure, so state law and ideology. And you can see that the, the see, I think I can do this. Yeah. Right there, you see those little arrows there? The arrows, the arrows are supposed to indicate the predominant direction of causality. Right? That is, the idea of the base and superstructure model is that the base has a stronger influence, usually a much stronger influence, on the superstructure than vice versa. So that we don't necessarily have complete mechanical determination, but from a dialectical point of view, organic or Well, unfortunately, at this point in the recording of the lecture, there was a, a technical glitch, and uh, several minutes of the lecture were not recorded. So what you'll hear for the next couple of minutes is uh, some co brief comments that would indicate what is the material that was missing. So we're looking at the slide of uh, the basin superstructure model and looking at the arrows which point from the uh, base, the eggs at the bottom, t upward uh, toward the superstructure. And that indicates the dominant direction of causality according to the basin superstructure model, right? That is, the superstructure is based on the base. That's why we call it that. Uh, however, uh, that since there's an organic relationship between the superstructure and the base, there must be some causality, some causal interaction in both directions. And so the, the slide that you're seeing now has some green arrows in it which point downward and that indicate the possibility of some uh, causality that goes from the superstructure to the base. And in fact, Marx points out in his 
a history of the social movements in the middle of 19th century France and his book that's called The 18th Brumaire, he thought that the that part of the superstructure had had a significant effect on the social movements at the time and prevented the change, or at least held back the change, from a uh, from an outmoded set of social relationships uh, to a new one. So uh, it's not just uh, a theoretical possibility that the superstructure can affect the base, but uh, according to Marx, it has actually happened. But he's also uh, wants to say, and this slide shows that here, that uh, the superstructure effects can occur but he says mainly they keep the social relationships of production in, in the base from changing. They're not primarily uh, effects that would tend to bring about something new, but to prevent something uh, from changing. So in his basic principle here is in red. It's not the consciousness of man that determines their being. But on the contrary, there's social being, and that includes the social relationships of production, that determines their consciousness. Now, we need to introduce a second uh, factor at this point. Uh, we've talked about the social relationships of production, but we need also to talk about the forces of production. So what are the forces of production? So the, the principal force of production, the most important one, is workers to produce things, right? So the working class is a force of production. But uh, workers can't do very much unless they have uh, factories and mines and transportation networks and scientific knowledge and uh, educational institutions also contribute. There's many aspects of the forces of production are uh, necessary or at least uh, beneficial in uh, bringing about production. So Marx's uh, principal thesis about uh, what makes a revolutionary a revolution possible is that the forces of production can come into contradiction with the relations of production. And here's a brief quote from our, our reading. He says, at a certain stage of the development of the material productive forces of society, they come into contradiction with the existing relations of production, and then an epic of social revolution begins. So I want to give two examples of the FR contradiction, and that is the forces relations contradiction. The first has to do with uh, capitalist, capitalist crises. Now, Marx's view, and it's certainly this is certainly true, it's a feature of the capitalist system, to have periodic economic crises, which are, are very destructive. They not only lower profits and mean, uh, ma mean misery for many workers, but they, they also uh, destroy means of production or and at least hold back the further development that would have taken place without the crises. So a second kind of uh, example of the effect of the contradiction of the forces of production and the relations of production is imperialist wars that cause enormous destruction, kill millions of people, uh, and destroy factories, mines, transportation, and also divert whatever production is done into things which are fundamentally uh, harmful and destructive. So... Why am I saying imperialist war, for example, is a result of the relations of production, right? By Lenin, for example, is that it's a, that war is an inevitable, uh, war, and wars that come over and over again, a, a whole long era of war, is an inevitable feature of capitalism. It's a kind of extension of the competitive nature of capitalist social relations. And sometimes that social relations have to take the form of violent conflict, even ones which are enormously destructive to both sides. And that especially in the era of imperialism, or what we now call globalization, these wars happen a lot and they kill a lot of people. And if you sort of follow the 
at the current foreign affairs, you're going to see this is true in many places and kill a lot of people. So, <clears throat> there's two interpretations that uh, are, I think, are important. Both of these interpretations are elaborated in the English language discussion of the basic superstructure model. One of these views is quite old, and the other is more recent, or at least the terminology is recent. So, <clears throat> well, first view says now we have, at the bottom of the page, we have forces of production, and we say we'll have three, in the three different uh, vertical columns, we'll have different sets of social relations, uh, different modes of production, and different uh, typical sets of forces of production. And then what this productive forces determinism says is that the forces of production determine the relationships of production. If the forces of production are in a circumstance where they don't have an appropriate set of relations of production, instead they have relations of production that hold them back, then the forces of production have the tendency to result in a change, usually a big change, in the relationships of production. So the forces of production determine the relations of production. This is called productive forces determinism. Uh, I think we should call this the social democratic interpretation. It is typically, it's a point of view that opposes revolution. And I think I have a next slide which explains that a little bit. Uh, the idea is that the productive force of determinism says that any revolution or rather a big change in the social relations have to wait for the productive forces to mature, right, to grow to a higher level. Uh, and then in the meantime, the revolution isn't possible, but after the forces of production mature, the revolution will either be easy or it won't be necessary. Right? So this is the sort of anti-revolutionary understanding of uh, Marxist ideas, which has been around for a long time. Right? That is, this so kind of social democratic thinking becomes prominent about 1900 and uh, has been fought over by people who are describe themselves as influenced by Marx ever since. Okay? Um, this is also assumed in so-called theories of national liberation. And, uh, you know, since I'm older than everybody here, <laughs> I, have to, I remember many of these wars, like the Vietnam War, but they, I, I think that this is a much less common phenomenon now. But the general idea is that the people who are, uh, lived in former colonies tried to throw off the rule of their colonial masters in Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia. Uh, and the idea, then the question is, what kind of system should replace colonialism? Right? And, that, and then, of course, the leftists are going to say, oh, we should have socialism or we should have communism, whichever their favorite alternative is. But national liberation theory usually said, well, we can't do that because, you know, we're an undeveloped country. So our forces of production would not uh, sustain a socialist or a communist uh, system, and therefore we have to find some sort of a, of a halfway house, right, a, a better kind of capitalism in the meantime. Uh, I would just say, if you look at this uh, in, in, in some sort of gross examples, I'd have to say that um, the result is not better. I have in mind, for example, Angola, right? A place where there were three different uh, national liberation movements, one controlled by the CIA, not the best, of course. Uh, but uh, the one that won uh, then turned into the government in Angola and is now ruled by a small group of billionaires, right? Uh, and they did this with the assistance of uh, not only the sympathy of many people, but also help from the Cuban government and from an army of uh, Cuban soldiers who come and help them. But the result is, well, in my book, not better. So, okay, uh, national liberation. <clears throat> so here's the second interpretation. And the second interpretation says that in the interaction between the relationship of some production and the forces of production, 
it isn't true that one side is always dominant, right? So let me point to this a little bit. Okay. Oops. Wrong one. I need this one. So you can see here, the forces of production are, are have a, a, an effect on the relationship to the production that's decisive. That's what the arrow is supposed to mean. But in this second one, the, the, the base influences the forces of production in the predominant direction. And in the third one, it's reversed again. So you can see why that's called the zigzag, right? Uh, between these two, sometimes, here's the, here's the two, sometimes this side influences that side, and sometimes this side influences that side, uh, but that uh, there's no universal or, or constant relation uh, of causation. So, the zigzag model says that relations and forces of production are in an organic relation. So, uh, whatever causation is, this is always at least a little bit in both directions. Uh, the changes in the relationship of production sometimes cause changes in the force of production. So, what would be an example of that? One example would be a, a successful revolution. A successful revolution in a country that's not very well developed may lead to a big increase in the productivity and output of that country. Key example would be Soviet Union, although there are other examples, right? That is, the Soviet Union turned from a, uh, from turned Russia from being a very backward power to being a world power, uh, an industrial giant that could use their resources, say, to defeat the German uh, invasion. So uh, it can happen that the like, that the relations of production, uh, new relations of production, can produce a big increase in the forces of production. Of course, it could also go the other way. <laughs> New relations of production could hold it back. So, uh, what this means is that uh, a revolution could create new forces of production, and therefore, waiting for those forces to mature is not necessary, and in fact, may be absolutely the, the wrong thing to do. Right? So, new forces of production could be created by a revolution rather than waiting for new forces of production to create the revolution. So that's the zigzag theory. So I think that this zigzag theory is the, right, the best way to interpret Marx. But I would say just as a scholarly question, right, when you look over all the manuscripts and books and try to figure out what he said, some of the things that Marx did say did sound like productive forces of determinism. That, there's a, there is that element in there. So uh, to actually make the case that Marx is a zigzagger and not a productive force of determinist is it's a job, right? But I've seen people do that job, and I agree with them. Okay. So I think I think that's it. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> We're still not too much over. So, okay, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the causal role of ideas or ideologies or of politics. Because many people understand the base and superstructure model or the forces relations contradiction as being something that happens uh, without human agency, right? It just happens to us, it's not something we do, right? So I think that is not the interpretation that is best for the text that we read. Marx says that the ideological forms in which men become conscious of the conflict between their relations and forces of production uh, uh, are those in which they fight it out, right? So. Law, politics, religion, art, and philosophy are ideological forms. They, are, they constitute a kind of arena in which people fight out the relationship that uh, would result or could possibly resolve the relationships uh, the, the between the relations and forces and production. So Marx says here that an era of revolution begins when this conflict emerges. He doesn't say 
that the revolution is guaranteed to happen, right? That depends on what happens as people fight it out, right? And of course, we have lots of revolutions that people wanted and never happened. We have lots of revolutions that did happen and failed, right? Just for example, one in Germany in 1923 and one in Hungary in about 1919, right? So lots of revolutions fail. That doesn't mean that the forces and relations of production were not in conflict. It means people didn't take advantage of their opportunity. <clears throat> so <clears throat> ideas and politics matter, but they matter in the context of the forces versus the relation of production. So I think one of the reasons that Marx emphasizes this idea, and he developed this fully in the book that he wrote with Engels but never published, called The German Ideology, he's fighting against people who say we can change the world just by changing people's thinking. He says that doesn't happen, right? You have to fight. But if the forces and relations of production are not in conflict, then you, you can't win, right? That is, the opportunity to make a big change depends on these material social relationships and their relationships with one another. Uh, and then just the last thing, I'm quoting something that Marx said a couple of years earlier than this, in an essay he wrote in 1843. He says, ideas become a material force when they are grasped by the mathless, right? Because if people are motivated to carry out some project, then they can, or if they're lucky, apply the material force which would be necessary to make it succeed. So, that's all I have. And I'm sorry about 10 minutes too long. <laughs> okay, so I hope that people will want to make comments or make questions. And as Professor Lee said, you can, um, Ask in English or in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs>